The message you're about listening to is from Pastor E. A. Adibui, the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. The covenant keeping God. God of Isaac. The God of multiplication. God of Jacob. The only one who can change a man to a nation. We worship you. Thank you for all you've done for us in the past. Thank you for what you are doing now. Thank you for what we are going to do in the future. Thank you for where you are taking us. Thank you for glory ahead. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. And Father, my God, I pray that everything your children need to hear so that they can become what you plan for them to become, Father, send it to them today. Amen. Stand by us, Lord. Amen. Strengthen us. Amen. And let your joy be our strength. Amen. Thank you, almighty God. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Wave at one or two people and say, good morning, God bless you. And then you may please be seated. We're continuing with our series, Going Higher. And now we are in part 67. And we'll see on First Kings chapter 19, verse 19. First Kings 19, verse 19. So Elijah departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Last Sunday, we stressed the need for diligence. That while God is sovereign, he can do whatever he likes, but he insists on diligence. So if you are ever going to get to great heights in God, you must get ready for hard work. You see, this is because every good thing demands hard work. Whether you believe it or not. For example, in Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Second Corinthians 9, verse 6, the Bible says, if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. What does that mean? Sowing bountifully is hard work. Ask any farmer. If we're going to sow on, uh, on a large farm, yes, we're going to work hard. But do you know that reaping bountifully is harder work? Harvest is harder work than sowing. Why? Because there is a time limit for harvesting. You don't harvest in the time limit the fruit we rot. Reaping is harder work than sowing. My prayer is that your harvest will be great. 
I give you another prayer that God will give you the grace to be able to bring in the harvest. <laughs> when Peter cast his net and caught so much fish that he couldn't carry it alone in his boat, he sent for others to come and help him. That's double hard work. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27. Proverbs 12, verse 27 says, The lazy, the slothful man will not roast the meat he caught in hunting. You know what that means? Hard work to hunt. Harder work to prepare what you have caught so that it will not rot. God is not going to waste his anointing on a man who will win souls and not follow them up. Soul winning is easier job than following them up till they mature. <laughs> That's why some people prefer the work of the evangelist to that of a pastor. You just get up there, Jesus saves, amen. He heals, amen. He loves you, amen. He has sent me to you today, it's your day of salvation, amen. You want to give your life to Jesus, come forward, amen. They kept. And then the evangelist packs his load and disappears. Leaving the pastor to do the hard work of, uh, <laughs> what do they call them? New converts in training, moving them from there to workers in training watching over them until they can stand on their own feet. It is easier to give birth to a baby than to take care of the baby till he becomes an adult. Ask those people who are already family people. They will tell you the work of a mother over her children never ends. By the time the children are becoming mothers, eh, the grandma has just started work. God will not give anointing to somebody who is slothful. As a matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9, Proverbs 18, verse 9, God describes the lazy man as a waster. He won't waste his anointing on you if you are lazy. That's why I'm hammering the issue of diligence, hard work. It takes hard work to become a champion. I used to be a boxer. I told you that. I don't look like one now. If I box now, I only box the devil. It takes harder work to remain a champion than to become one. When you are struggling to become champion, oh, you stretch yourself. You do road work. You wake early while everybody is sleeping. Uh, you are running. Uh, you are... Shadow boxing, you are doing everything. Then you become champion. Congratulations. And from that day onward, everybody will be pursuing your crown. And you know yourself, if you have any sense at all, that it is better never to have become a champion than to be an ex champion. The pain of the ex-champion is not the bruises on his body. It's the shame of you 
walking in the street, and those who have been calling you champion see you coming, and they turn their faces away from you. I pray for all of you who are listening to me. You will reach the top. And God will give you the grace to stay on top. It's going to require hard work. The anointed cannot afford to be lazy. Read Isaiah chapter 61 from verse 1 to 3. Isaiah 61 from verse 1 to 3. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Anointed me for what? To sit down and fold my arms? No. One, to preach the good news. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts 1, verse 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me. Witnesses to me where? Just in the comfort of your church? No. You may start at Jerusalem, but you are going to go to Judea, and you are then to proceed to Samaria. And then you have to proceed to the uttermost part of the world. Anointing is not for laziness. It's for hard work. You have to preach. You have to heal. (laughs) Mark chapter 16, verse 18. Mark 16, verse 18 says, You will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Beautiful, isn't it? You want power. So you can lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. Let me show you one passage in the Bible. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 to 18. Matthew 8, verse 14 to 18. And you will see that the moment you have a healing gift, the crowd will come. Jesus healed the mother of Badaila of Peter. (laughs) And then in the evening, they brought all those who are sick. All those who are, who are demon possessed. The, the news spread. And they began to come and come and come. Read that passage. You will see something there. <laughs> My Lord himself. Eh? When he saw the multitude. When the crowd became overwhelming. <laughs> he dodged. Read it. I'm not the one who wrote it there. He had to go to somewhere else and say, you know. <laughs> you want anointing. And you are not ready for hard work. Ah. You have a lot to do. You preach, you heal, you comfort the brokenhearted. Anybody is in any form of trouble, they will call on you. Uh, You are to set the captives free. All the people with demons will be paying you constant visits. And if you know what casting out demons means, it means in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Ephesians 6, verse 12, wrestling. <laughs> you will be wrestling with forces of darkness. It's wrestling for the lazy. You'll be setting captives free. The Lord had anoint, anointing. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. But read your Bible. In Mark chapter 6, verse 31, Mark 6, verse 31, he had to tell the disciples, hey, let's take a break. 
because they became so busy, there wasn't enough time to eat. Anointing is not for lazy people. I'm not saying it to frighten you. I'm saying it to get you prepared. Because even before today is over, someone is going to get anointed. I told you, at least some of you heard me say it before. When the Bible, when I read the Bible, and it says, "Covet earnestly the best gifts." Covet best gifts. I said, "Ah, God, I got it." One double the anointing on Elisha, double the anointing on Paul, double the anointing on Peter, double the anointing on even the Lord Jesus Christ while he was here, and double it again. That's what I want. And I told you what he told me. They won't let you rest. They're asking for a dangerous thing. They won't let you rest. I said, I don't mind. <laughs> eh, how stupid we can be. Once I was asking me not too long ago, oh, daddy, I heard that you traveled abroad. I said, yes. Uh, what for? I said, I went on vacation. <laughs> it's a vacation. Eh? He said, how many sermons did you preach on for your vacation? Eh, not many. Maybe just two in, in England. Uh, and then we move on to have a convention in Europe. And, uh, and then we He said, that's vacation. I said, yeah. If you are not ready for hard work, please don't pray for anointing. Anointing is not for lazy people. Get that clear. I'm talking to you because you are growing higher. Amen. But then there's something else that followed, which is very exciting, which I want to share with you today. As Elijah was passing by Elisha. He cast his mantle upon him. I want to talk to you about a brush with fire. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, it is written. But to those of you who fear his name, with the son of righteousness arise, with healings in his wings. Healings in his wings. I pray that that healing wings will brush you today. Anything that the Holy Spirit has touched has been touched by fire and it will change permanently. Exodus chapter 3 verse 1 to 5 because the life of somebody is about to change totally today. Exodus chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5, the Bible tells us the fire of God touched that backside of the desert and God called it from that moment onward, holy ground. Moses, take off your shoes. Where you are standing now is holy ground. God touched ordinary soil and it became holy ground. How holy was the ground? Well, Exodus chapter 4 from verse 1 to 20. Exodus 4 from verse 1 to 20. Moses, what is that in your hand? He said, Rod, threw it on the ground. He did. As soon as the rod touched the ground, it became a serpent. The rod has touched holy ground. 
By the time you get to verse 20 there, the Bible says, Moses left for Egypt. He took this, 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 and he took the rod of God in his hand. The rod of the shepherd had turned to the rod of God because that rod has touched the holy ground. But there's something there that you might not notice. When Moses threw that rod down and he became a serpent, and the Lord said to him, pick up the serpent by the tail. As he was picking the serpent, his own hand touched the holy ground. And it was no longer an ordinary hand. You don't believe me? Read Exodus chapter 17 from verse 8 to 13. Exodus 17, 8 to 13. When there was war between Israel and the Amalekites, and Moses went on to the hilltop, as long as he raised his hand, the children of Israel were prevailing. When his hand got tired, the other people began to win. There were two people with him, Aaron and Hor. They had four hands. Moses had only two. But they knew that hands are different from hands. The hand that had touched the holy ground is different from ordinary hands. I'm praying that today you are going to have a brush with fire. That even your hands will no longer be ordinary. His hand had become hands that can now transmit wisdom. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. Second Kings chapter 4, from verse 38 to 41. Second Kings 4, from verse 38 to 41. The children, son of the prophets, were hungry. Elisha, and if God wants, we will spend some time with Elisha later. Elisha told the wood servant, all right, let's do some cooking for the boys. But somebody had gone out and had brought him poisonous fruits and cut it into the food. When the people tried to eat the food, they discovered, ah, this poison Elisha said, bring me some flour. Since when does flour become an antidote to poison? But <laughs> when ordinary flour touches anointed hands, it becomes something else. Like I was telling my children in Europe not long ago, the power of God turns the ordinary to extraordinary. It's, it will be interesting to you if you read John chapter 9 from verse 1 to 7. John 9, 1 to 7. When Jesus saw a man who was born blind, the Bible said he spat on the ground, made some mud out of it, and anointed his eyes. Ordinary mud can become anointed mud. It all depends on in whose hand the mud is. He anointed the eyes, where the eyes were supposed to be, and brand new eyes formed. In Judges chapter 15, from verse 14 to 15, Judges 15, from verse 14 to 15, the Bible tells us that when they brought Samson to the Philistines, as soon as the Philistines began to rejoice, the fire of God came. We call it the Spirit of God. <laughs> but he said the ropes that bound them were burnt as if they came in contact with fire. There is fire that is on, 
unseen, invisible. And because that fire came on him, he took the jawbone of an ass, an ordinary jawbone of an ass, the jawbone of an animal that had died, and he became a weapon of mass destruction. When you are anointed, everything you touch will become anointed. Mark chapter 5 from verse 25 to 34. Mark 5, 25 to 34. Bible talks about healing through the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. Acts 5, 14 to 16 tells us that even the shadow of Peter was healing the sick. Acts chapter 19 from verse 11 to 12, Acts 11 from verse, Acts 19 from verse 11 to 12, even the anchor chiefs of Paul was healing the sick. You need a brush with the fire of God. And you can get it today. Because if you get it, and it's available, because in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, the promise is that Jesus Christ will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. If you get it, Oh, things will change. And you need it. Why? Because you never can tell when the enemy may want to strike. Judges chapter 14, from verse 5 to 6. Judges 14, from verse 5 to 6. Samson was going down to Timnath. All of a sudden, a lion roared at him. And fire came on him. And you know the rest of the story. You need that touch with fire. Just in case the enemy decides to roar. And you can tell the enemy, I am more than ready for you. You need that fire because as you are growing in the Lord, there is bound to be resistance from the enemy. And you will need the fire to uproot obstacles. Acts chapter 13 from verse 6 to 12. Acts 13 from verse 6 to 12. Paul was preaching to a governor. And the governor was listening. But the sorcerer was distracting the attention of the governor. Fire came. <laughs> and Paul uprooted the obstacle. I'm going to ask you to cry to God for a brush of the heavenly fire today. So that from now on, your work of the ministry will become much, much easier. But then, before we begin to pray that God's fire should fall, because that will be our prayer today, you need to know that if the fire of God falls, if it falls on those who do not belong to him, it consumes them. But if it falls on those who belong to him, it empowers them. The Bible says so in Daniel chapter 3, from verse 19 to 30. Daniel 3, 19 to 30. When they threw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their yokes were destroyed by the fire. They walk out of the fire into promotion. 
But those who are not on the side of the Lord, who got close to that fire, they were consumed. So, before we ask fire to fall, if you are not on the side of God already, please cross over. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ so that he can baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire too. If you are standing by when the fire begins to fall and you are not on the side of the Lord, <sighs> the result might not be very pleasant. So I appeal to you, please surrender your life to Jesus Christ now. Bow your head wherever you are and cry unto him and ask him to please save your soul. Wash you in his blood. Receive you into the family of God so that when the fire of God falls, it will be to empower you, not to consume you. Pray now. And I will be praying with you in a moment. Thank you, Father. My Father, my God, once again, I'm thanking you for your word. And I'm thanking you for all those who have decided to surrender their lives to you now. Please, my Father, my God, receive them today. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away their sins. And let them become part and parcel of your family, Lord. So that when your fire begins to fall, it will be to purify them. It will be an answer to their prayers, destroying their yokes, and making them vessels unto honor in your hands. And please, my Father and my God, as they surrender their life to you, don't let them backslide. As for those of us who are already your children, as we cry unto you today, just like Elisha had a brush with the fire that was on Elijah, I pray that all my children will be crying out to you today. You will let my anointing flow to them, and you will empower them mightily, so that very soon I'll be hearing mighty testimonies of great exploits for them. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Please join us on this same station at this time for another wonderful experience as Pastor E.A. Adeboye exposes the deep mysteries in the Word of God.